ReasonConf is brought to you by our gold sponsors, Ahrefs and Chain Street. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Jem. I've been doing uh, ReasonML full time since September in the context of React Native um, in the company I work for called Linus. Um, and I've just like gotten into like shit posting on Twitter, and it's going pretty well. So I'm considering doing this full time. All right, and uh, this is a quick story about uh, relearning ReasonML. So this is in the context of onboarding a colleague, and you might also know of this problem if you've been doing ReasonML for a long time. You might have forgotten like some of the learnings you had, and like things are super obvious to you, but not for uh, newcomers. Um, I'll also mention something about custom operators, and lastly, also a bit about. Uh, generation of findings. And a fourth thing that I think we won't have time for, but maybe another time. So, lessons relearned onboarding. Um, one of the issues we ran into is this concept of uh, shadowing. So, specifically in the context of um, styles in React Native, um, if you want to do like a dynamic style um, and you create this, you know, button text style that takes uh, color as input, you have a problem here. You'll get an error and it's, it's kind of not super obvious uh, due to the error message, but what is happening here is actually that color, um, uh, this should have said background color, but uh, the color here is being shadowed by the color function being exposed in the uh, local um, module, um, local open here. Um, so obviously you can change this or fix this by renaming it so there's no name collisions. Um, but again, it's not super obvious. Um, optional param parameters is also a, a thing. If you have this, um, um, again, in the style of styles in React Native, um, you have a bunch of optional uh, parameters to construct styles and to actually have this thing execute, you have to give it unit in the end which again isn't like super obvious. Um, so you, you can kind of fix this also by putting, if you have something, let's say an amount in this case, as the last argument, uh, here you actually tell um, the compiler that we are skipping the um, optional arguments and we just want to execute this. Um, another thing that's pretty cool about named uh, parameters um, is that it al allows you to do non-breaking changes to your APIs. Um, so you can keep on adding uh, optional named arguments and uh, still ship um, without any breaking changes, uh, assuming like it doesn't change any semantics to not include um, those optionals. Um, another gotcha was uh, lists. Um, this again wasn't uh, super obvious um, to my colleague uh, due to the representation of uh, linked lists. Um, and also like buckle script. Um, so you might have just come into ReasonML and just used the Reason React docs and ReasonML, but never actually gone into the buckle script uh, docs. Um, and here you'll see that there are there's documentation for these different things, uh, like win window variables, like for node environment, DOM, uh, and also this thing called belt. Um, belt and et cetera. I mean, th there's like a lot of options out there and it's also not super clear what you should use and like can you consume OCaml libraries? And like these have uh, each their own um, focuses. For instance, Relu takes a more like uh, category theoretic approach to standard libraries, whereas Tablecloth tries to um, achieve like um, give you the same API between uh, when you're targeting native and JS. Um, unless we also have pervasives, which, which is what is being shipped in OCaml itself. Um, and talking about pervasives, there's also this useful thing called underscore underscore 
uh, module and, and uh, lock and file. And these are actually references to um, the module name, for instance, or the location in the file uh, and the file name. Um, and there's a bunch more you can find in the, uh, in the docs. Um, there's also this option of um, customizing which things you want to be warned about. Um, I believe it's all of these warnings are disabled by default in, in, in Reason. Um, and I think it's a good decision um, because a lot of these errors are not totally obvious to everyone. Um, so if you want to enable all the types of warnings there might be, you can use plus A. Uh, and then you use minus if you want to exclude things or just plus again for the specific uh, a warning. And you can also escalate a warning up to an error by adding them here. Um, so just one example of something that wasn't obvious to me when I discovered this yesterday and enabled it in our code base. Um, there's just like tons of warnings now. And like some of them are not like totally uh, obvious. Uh, even for me, even though I've been doing it for quite some time. Yep, and then there's uh, this concept of uh, modules being uh, like created implicitly by just like creating a reason file. If you have a reason file called snackbar.re, uh, it will al already be a, um, um, a module. And if you add module snackbar inside of the snackbar file, you actually have to access this through snackbar.snackbar. .snackbar. And this, again, wasn't like totally obvious to my colleague either. Um, yeah, and then the topic of custom operators. What are they and why might you use them? Um, so this is a bit of a contrived example, but you could define a operator which um, like concatenates and, and like builds up a file path. Um, but in this specific case, you have to be cautious because it's overriding the uh, uh, integer division operator. Um, so you could define one that is not taken, like slash slash. Um, and you can also do, you can also use operators for um, sequencing operations. Um, so you have this concept of a bind. So when you have something, and you have another function that will also return an option. You can sequence these by uh, calling bind. And you can define a um, convenience operator for this. Um, and then go along just saying like uh, this function and then uh, bind this, bind this. Um, and this one I also found pretty interesting like uh, it's maybe not a good idea, but here we're using like a uh, deprecated operator for actually extracting something out of a uh, option. So we would say, you know, we would call, uh, we would have an option, and to extract something from it, we need to provide it a default value. Um, and this kind of reads pretty well, um, but not might not be super obvious for you. Um, also, there was alluded to previously in one of the talks, this get in PPX, um, which also helps out with uh, consuming like deeply nested options. Um, but again, I, I personally would prefer using an operator instead of introducing um, uh, like a preprocessing um, operator or extension point. Um, And also, like this operator is also more ubiquitous among like different programming languages. You'll see them in like uh, F Sharp and Swift and Haskell. Um, uh, but you should probably like think uh, if I have a record, I should probably just consider using uh, like a baked-in native language feature, which is like like uh, a, a deep pattern match. Yes, so um, like bind and these operators are super useful uh, in the context of sequencing effects, uh, aka the M word. And there are like multiple things that are uh, monads. 
Um, for instance, promises is something you'll probably run into. And if you want to sequence promises, you can also use the exact same um, operator, the bind operator. Another thing we're also like overloading some operators for is like conditional rendering uh, reason react components. Um, so by doing this thing, um, it looks a bit more like what you do in JavaScript sometimes. Um, but just because you can doesn't mean you should uh, always. Um, so I had a short talk with Ben uh, yesterday. Um, and he said it pretty well that you know wh what you're doing here is actually trading a write time cost for read time cost. Um, this kind of assumes that there is like uh, knowledge within your organization that these operators mean these things. Um, that it's like a shortcut. Uh, so another place where it might be super useful to do is in the concept of DSLs, uh, domain specific languages. Um, a specific a example I have here is from uh, React Native, where we have this uh, concept of a library called Reanimated, in which you can declaratively um, uh, do animations and bind animations up to um, gestures. Um, and the idea here is that you're not ac actually executing anything, you're building up a description, sending this over to the native side, and this then can ensure you that everything is running uh, at 60 FPS because you're not sending things back and forth between native and JavaScript. Um, but specifically in like this case, um, it's a bit strange. Like you have this thing called an add function and multiply. And I think maybe we can do better by just using operators in this case. Um, so one proposal would be this library called uh, re-re-animated, uh, <laughs> where you could then override these probably more familiar and nicer to read uh, operators. And of course, you would not like expose or open this globally anywhere because then like you can't do math. Um, um, and another thing is also uh, that you can apply operators like functions by just wrapping them in parents. Uh, and the last topic is just a short note about automatic generation of bindings. Um, I think like there's the general consensus that it would be nice to have. Um, and it, it does in fact exist in other, in other languages. So F sharp has the TS to Fable, Kotlin has TS to Kotlin. OCaml and ReasonML also has some different projects, um, but it's like a non-trivial uh, problem. Um, and probably the, the most, or the worst thing is probably if we do automatic generation, we're like targeting the lowest common denominator in terms of API design. So specifically, um, this is an example of a binding I ran into. Um, where to reason developers, this is, you know, should obviously have been like a variant instead, because you have like these two options, play or stop, and then you have different things that are there when it's a play and different things that are there when it's stop. Um, I think we can do better, and I think the way forward may be a semi-automated process, so we gradually, um, enrich types um, and help help the uh, code generation tool when it fails. So the last thing is I want to say is basically that uh, it's immensely useful to have uh, JS and new ReasonML developers uh, reviewing your code um, because it keeps you grounded and it makes sure that you don't go crazy with operators and like introduce a lot of uh, like implicit knowledge. And that is my talk, and um, I'll stop here, but I have a reasonable poem as well, which I might share at uh, the winery or at ReasonConf US. Thanks. <laughs>